Good, thanks. So yeah, this week is our uh, last week that we are uh, teaching like you know in uh, kinetic kinetics of 3D rigid bodies. And based on our intended learning outcomes, we are finalizing our uh, intended learning outcomes with uh, gyroscopic motion this week. And you can find our lecture uh, videos in Blackboard uh, that I uploaded earlier for this week. And we basically discuss here the what is a gyroscope, what is uh, a spinning top. Uh, used for in engineering applications in general and we are we can see that our bodies the spinning top for example is symmetric with respect to that z axis therefore uh, it is also rotating about point o therefore uh, we told that we are going to define the motion with three angles that we know from earlier uh, they are called euler's angles so we can completely define the motion of the top uh, by using these three angles completely we can define by that. So here you can see how we defined uh, the motion. Uh, we are calling an angle like you know, phi, phi dot as precession around the z-axis, uh, notation around about the uh, x-axis and deviating from the central capital Z axis obviously and we have another angle like spin and uh, so by these three angles we are able to define the motion completely and uh, and obviously you know from our kinematics lectures that uh, in order to find out the final position of this uh, rotation you need to follow the sequence sequence of these angles but as you know again from our kinematics lectures when you are taking the time derivative of these angles uh, they, they behave like vectors as we identified earlier then therefore we can use uh, the time derivatives of these angles in order to identify the angular velocity of the top and we mentioned that you know we had different options to define the angular velocity of the top and the reference frames and here if we are defining the velocity of the xyz frame uh, different than the 3d bodies uh, angular velocity it is simplifying our calculations and for this assumption like capital omega is not equal to omega we know that we can use these three equations of motion with respect to x y and z axis and we here define the angular velocity of the xyz frame and also angular velocity of uh, our our axis as well and we show that they are different obviously and the angular velocity of the frames is not taking into account the spin ratio although the body has this component uh, for taking this into account it is complete motion our axis is not rotating about the z axis there is no need to do that because uh, if you only consider rotation around uh, rotation around uh, x and y axis you will see that the uh, inertial properties of the top is constant during the motion this is why there is no need to attach x y z axis to the spinning top and obviously uh, here we did some uh, we included our inertial properties in the equations and this is the final version of the equations that we can use but we told that these equations are a bit complicated and you need to use some numerical techniques in order to identify uh, the Euler's angles as a function of time so although it is good to know them and you may later on want to advance yourself in this kind of analysis depending on where you will work here in this lecture we are going to we are we are going to try to simplify these equations further in order to make sure that we can get some results by simple hand calculations 
So here, uh, steady precession is helping us for simplifying our motion. So when the notation angle theta, precession p, and spin c are all remain constant, then our equations getting much more simplified. You can see, uh, like you know, we have zero for uh, y and z uh, axis about y and z axis only one equation remains about the x axis and here we spoke a bit about gyroscopic effect i think this is one of the most amazing uh, effects throughout all our dynamics uh, lectures it is really fascinating and i really like it and normally i used to run a demo in the class uh, I had a small uh, like desktop uh, gyro and I was demonstrating this, but instead uh, I couldn't do this this year, but I provided you some videos. I hope you found them useful and uh, here you can see I left a link. I hope you found some time to watch this video because I believe this was kind of one of the really important uh, applications of our teaching. So here normally you would expect this weight the uh, the spinning rod to fall down because of the gravity but it is not the case because the uh, gyroscopic effect is counterbalancing this system and it is not falling down and this is what we call gyroscopic effect simply and here we provided a bit more uh, information because later on uh, we are going to watch a video as well and in that video, you will see that the uh, gyro or the spinning uh, disc, or, I mean, there's a spin, obviously, the disc is spinning its own axis, but when you hold it, it really tries to turn around the uh, like vertical axis as well. So here we try to explain that effect, why the spinning disc also wants to rotate around that capital axis, capital Z axis. So if you have the spinning uh, disc, this is also, again, as I said, trying to rotate about the capital Z axis. And this has significant effects in any rotating uh, machinery. Uh, take it, you can take it as a ship uh, engine, for example, because again, there is a rotating shaft, obviously, in, in turbine blades, for example. And whenever they are rotating, they are uh, creating other effects around different axes that you need to take into account when you are designing. Because they are creating uh, forces, significant forces sometimes, uh, on the bearings. And obviously, you need to take them into account when you are designing or selecting uh, this kind of bearings. This is just an example. And yeah, here I try to explain it a bit further. And as you will remember from lectures, the HO is the angular momentum of the spinning disk. And because of the gravity of this disk, we are creating it is creating a moment around the x axis right so and also from uh, from our mechanics lectures we know that this effect uh, is also called like angular impulse if you multiply this moment uh, with time you are getting an angular impulse which is causing this dho here uh, and obviously then when you take when you consider the total motion HO and DHO, you need to combine their effect. And obviously, this effect, this DHO pushing or pulling actually that HO into this direction. And this is causing this disc to rotate around the capital Z frame as well. And after that, we spoke a bit about that pre gyroscopes, uh, which has really significant uh, applications in aircraft, especially. And uh, I'm sure some of you already know, like, you know, uh, where we use them. And at this point, uh, before we start solving the question, I would like to stop here for a, a moment. 
So after we watch the video now, uh, we can try to solve our question. So here we have uh, a disk which is spinning uh, about this axis here, AB axis and with a constant rate omega s so when i see this i remember something at now uh, i received some questions about uh, accelerations why an acceleration for, for example zero and uh, this it appears that you know we need to read the questions very carefully uh, so here you can see we say it is a constant rate so if it is constant rate, you need to know what does it mean later on when you are trying to solve the question. And this is just an example. I'm just trying to make sure that you know you are reading what is given to you. So this is a constant rate of omega s, which is 250 radians per second. And the angle theta here, you can see this is also a constant. So what, what do you think that, you know, omega is constant and this theta is constant? Is there any message uh, in this question for you? So I believe this is trying to tell you that, you know, this question uh, is uh, mostly about uh, steady precession. So it is trying to, the question is trying to make sure that you are not really getting into complicated uh, equations of motions instead it is giving you a lot of tips to make sure that you know you are uh, you are getting the idea that this is a steady precession and obviously if it is a steady precession you you our, our equations are quite simplified so it is kind of giving you uh, the way showing you the way and we need to determine the rate of precession of arm o a so this arm what is the rate of precession? So as you watched in the video as well, uh, you would expect since there's a spin about this AB, due to that spin, you would expect the uh, OA rod to be rotating about this vertical axis, right? So this rotation uh, can be expressed by omega P, the rate of precession, so we are trying to find out what is that omega p rate of precession. Okay, so the first step, as always, when you try to solve our uh, solutions in dynamics or mechanics or actually in different uh, lectures as well, probably it will be the same. So the free body diagram, right? So we need to create first the free by the diagram of our system. So you can see here what we have. Let's let's try to find out. Let's try to establish our uh, axis frames first. So this one, vertical one, usually we express this as like capital Z, like stop precession, and this axis we can define this as capital Y axis and obviously we will have B U and W. We will have capital X axis as well. And here since we are identifying our motion of the top, here the spin axis normally we express this with Z. Okay. And initially you can see that uh, there is a kind of angle theta deviating from the capital Z frame. And obviously then because of this rotation, our Y, small Y can be somewhere here because again, we have a theta here, right? So this theta will be here also theta. And you will see that there is no need to move. We can just move in Y, Z plane. Therefore, our small X also can be somewhere here. So first we establish our uh, frames and then now we know that this theta is uh, given as 30, 30 degrees. So now we can try to solve our question. Here you can see like you now this all distances are given 600. Uh, we have also this 
uh, distance r under 50 millimeters i think we now have everything that we need to solve the problem and we are trying to find what is this omega p so first thing again after free body the second thing after free body diagrams is to find out the moments of inertia obviously and we will continue by defining the moments of inertia of the system. Okay, so now we will make an assumption again. Assume, assume it is a thin disk, which is like disk C is assumed to be a thin disk. Therefore, therefore, about the center of mass point G, now we can write down our uh, moment of inertia term. Uh, after solving this problem, I know that uh, I received uh, several actually uh, questions about that. Like, how do we know the moment of inertia of this thin disk, for example, right? And you will see now uh, we have different uh, moments of inertia about different axes. So how how can we have different uh, moments of inertia for diff about different axes? So after solving this question, I'm going to uh, give you kind of a worked example and try to work out how we identify the moment of inertia terms for a thin disk, okay? So I hope we will have some time for that one as well. So the moment of inertia about X and Y axis are, you will remember maybe already now, but M R one over four M R squared. So you can see that this is imagine uh, our x axis. This is y axis. Imagine you are trying. Uh, it is very, I think, uh, intuitive to understand why we have uh, moment of inertia terms same about x and y axis. Now, what you need to imagine? Imagine you are trying to rotate this disk around the x axis. Okay. And imagine now we are trying to rotate about the y-axis. So you will see that actually there is a symmetrical uh, symmetry uh, property, right? So whenever you will try to rotate this disk about x or y-axis, you will need to apply the same moment. But whenever you want to rotate it about the z-axis, obviously it is different than x and y-axis. Right. So whenever you will see that you know x equal y, so it is I think uh, quite intuitive to understand why they are equal. Right. So, but obviously when I will finish this question, we will try to find out mathematically why they are equal. So we have our values, I believe. So this is one over four. M is given, right? Ten kilograms and R squared. Our R is given 150 millimeters, but I will I will write this down in meters, 0 0.15. Therefore, this property is equal to 0 0.05625 kilograms meters squared. So this is our one of the terms of uh, moment of inertia. And we can now write down the other term, Iz. Iz is two times our moment of inertia about x and y axis, actually. Therefore, one over two mr squared. So you can easily see that this will be 10 r again, 0 0.15. Then you can see that this is 0 0.11. 25 kilograms 
meter squared. So the question is now, can we use directly ix, iy, and iz terms of moment of inertia? As far as I remember, again, one of the problems uh, my students doing, uh, one of the mistakes that they do is, okay, they can calculate the moment of inertia terms and they are just uh, simply, when, when, when they got these results, they are simply inputting them into our uh, equations of motion. So what could be the problem here, or not the problem, but uh, what we need to consider here more? So what are these terms? So I will try to give some information about, some uh, uh, tips about that, uh, or try to give you the procedure to think about. Like, as you know, Ix, Iy, and Iz are moment of inertia terms with respect to the axis passing through point G, right? But during the motion, the rotation is happening about the Z axis and about point O, not about point G, right? So this is, we need to be very, this is something we need to be very careful about. When we are writing moments of, uh, of equation, uh, uh, motion, we need to make sure that these uh, moments of inertia terms are about the axis of rotation, okay? If the rotation is about point G, obviously then you are going to use these properties directly, but in our case, rotation is about point O, therefore we need to use uh, parallel axis theorem in order to find out their values about point O. So when I will move forward to our next slide, Unfortunately, we are going to lose all these uh, annotations, but if necessary, I will uh, write them down again. So, for <clears throat> about the rotation, about the rotation about point O, we need to use Parallel axis theorem. Okay, so we know that the parallel axis theorem states that we need to use IG, the moment of inertia term with respect to point G, plus the effect of the distance on the moment of inertia, um, D squared plus Z squared. So the, the D here will be, in our case, X squared or Y squared, depending on the axis that we are uh, considering about. So let's write this down. We know the I, I is obviously around the X and Y axis. Here are, we have our uh, X, Y axis, right here are again capital X and X axis. This is Y. Here we have Z, and this is our capital Z, and this is Z axis again. So now we are interested about the rotation about this uh, Z axis, right? So our IG is 0 0.05625 plus our M is. 10 uh, distance is zero, in this case, x and y zero, plus our z is 0 0.6 meters, okay? Therefore, we can calculate this i about point O is equal to 3.65625 kilogram meter squared. So this is one of our properties. And now we can speak about Iz. So Iz is again Iz with respect to point G plus, I think uh, when I was 
talking about these frames, I told about Z axis. So this is a simple mistake, I sorry about that. So this is about uh, rotation about uh, Z, X and Y axis, obviously. So I, Z, now this is where I'm speaking about uh, Z axis, X squared plus Y squared, it will be. So 0 0.011 plus, both x and y are zero therefore iz will be 0 0.1125 kilogram meter squared so since about o as well the rotation is about z axis it doesn't matter you are calculating from this point or this point you will end up with the same uh, iz about that axis and in the beginning of the question, we discussed about the conditions given in the in the problem, and we identified because of the given properties, we identified that the motion is actually steady precession, steady precession, and for steady precession, we know that the only equation of motion holds is about x see we need to write again what is x so this is given as equal to squared sine theta cos theta plus i z Sine theta dot cos theta plus p dot. Okay. So now obviously we are writing equation of motion about this x axis. So what is the moment? The moment obviously will be created by the weight, right? We have weight, and obviously this weight is trying to create a motion about x axis, which is given as ninety-eight point one. That was ten, right? Ten kilograms times nine eight one. Obviously, ninety-eight point one times zero point six times thirty. So. Here is our z axis, right? Spin axis. Here we have y. This is capital Y, capital Z. Okay. So, my question now at this point uh, whether this moment is positive or negative. I mean, I wrote down as positive, but I'm not sure whether it is positive or negative. So please try to see based on the right hand rule again. I'm showing left, but <laughs> based on the right hand rule, uh, try to identify whether it should, it should be positive or negative. I think this is one of the most important questions again, because if you cannot identify the right sense of this moment, obviously you are going to uh, you are going to end up with different sense of rotation as well so this is very important and so what you need to do is obviously the weight is going to create a rotation about x-axis like this way and the only thing that you need to do curl your fingers in that sense uh, of right hand and see where your finger is going to so in this case, you, you will see that your fingers are going from Z to Y, right? So since it is going from Z to Y, it means it is negative, okay? So this is our negative sign. So in order to get a positive sense of rotation, when you curl your fingers in order to follow the rotation, your fingers should follow x y z like linear way like if it is going from x to y it is positive if your fingers are going from depending on the problem from y to z again positive 
but if it is reversing this uh, x, y, z positive, if your fingers are curling from y to z, it's positive. But if your finger is curling from y to z to y, it is negative. If curling from y to x, again, you can see it is negative. Okay, but this is very important uh, sign convention to be used in our problem. Um, now let's write down our uh, parameters on the right hand side. Uh, we have minus uh, in our equation this time minus what is our i is a uh, three point six five two six five and four c squared sine our angle is 30 degrees sine 30 cos 30 plus 0 0.0 sorry 0 0.1125 E dot sine thirty dot cosine thirty plus two fifty. What is the two fifty? See our spin rate, right? So two hundred fifty is our spin rate. So here you will end up with a quadratic equation one point. 5345 squared minus 14.0625 dot minus 29.43 to zero. So we need to solve this equation. Solving the quadratic equation, you will get dot 10.9 radians per second, or it can be high rate, uh, or it can be equal to minus one point, so lower rate, 1.76 radians per second. So this is the solution of our problem, guys. And I hope uh, you found it useful. And I tried to take uh, some opportunities here, for example, to explain the senses of our equations and calculations and everything. And one thing, again, I want to make sure that, you know, remind you that uh, you need to read the questions very carefully, okay? So this can be, okay, uh, we identified the problem was a steady precession in this question, but in another question, it can be the opposite. So you can immediately, when you will see something like that, you can immediately, uh, because of your photographic memory maybe, you can immediately say, okay, this is steady precession, but it may not be the case. So therefore, please try to read the questions carefully and try to identify the type of problem very carefully. So as I said, at this point, I think we have time. Uh, let's check. We have around 15 minutes. So I will try to continue as far as I can. And if you know, I cannot finish by the time, obviously we are free to leave any time, uh, but I will try to finish that and at least it will be available. Uh, in Blackboard. So before actually going for that, I just want to remind you that I, today in the morning, I uh, created a survey on Blackboard. You can see it is it on content page when you will sign up. Uh, it is about the topics that you want me to cover during our revision week. So next week, obviously, we finalize our lectures and next week I am planning uh, to solve some revision problems to go over the most challenging uh, concepts that you find that challenging. 
So please uh, use that survey to let me know which aspects that you uh, struggle with most. So the revisions will be helpful to like, you know, point out or like solve some examples and uh, remember the main or challenging cost concepts. I have so already something in my mind uh, based on the questions posted on uh, Blackboard. Like relative motion analysis, I think it is quite challenging. So I'm going to solve some examples on that anyway. Uh, but about other topics, please, please try to respond to that survey as soon as possible. It will be available until Tuesday next week uh, because Tuesday will be the last day that I can prepare some uh, uh, questions, obviously, uh, relevant questions for these revisions. So please try to respond to that as soon as possible, but not later than uh, next Tuesday. Okay. Um, and after that, uh, I think another topic that I need to mention, uh, the deadline for our online assessment, the second assessment was yesterday. Um, and still the assessment is available for our students who got extensions for different reasons, say automatic extensions or some other reasons. Okay, so the uh, the quiz, the, the online assessment will be available. But the point is, if you submit it already and if you don't have extension, you may still have access. But if you will start again, so it may it may not be a problem because it will get the highest value. But uh, at the end of the semester, I'm going to check the students with uh, extension. Okay, so if you attempt after uh the deadline obviously you may get penalized by attempting after the deadline okay but this is i think another important announcement that i wanted to make so now uh, we can continue our uh work example so uh this is i think quite a simple one to demonstrate the concept but uh, we are trying to calculate the mass moment of inertia for the disk about it is center of mass, which is a uh, point here, right? So Z axis again, this is perpendicular to the plane, X, Y plane. And let's try to analyze the problem. So origin is selected at the center of mass and Z is perpendicular. Disk has a radius, capital R, and thickness obviously this is not here uh, clear much but the thickness is t and mass is m we need to make some assumptions in order to uh, have in order to perform our integrals uh, simply simplify our integrals so we are assuming that t is uniform through the thick disk and material is homogeneous uh, i mean there are ways to obtain the properties when the disk is not uniform and material is not homogeneous but this is not uh, the level in our course here so we are assuming these two things so in order to find out obviously we need to use integral and obviously in order to integrate a property you, you are you need to use a differential element and here we can choose again there are different ways there are different options that you can create your differential elements maybe in this way or some other like positions but this is i think most simple way that you can integrate so we are performing our analysis by considering that uh, differential element dr around the z axis so the radius of that uh, differential element is r and its thickness is dr and obviously when you are considering this disk element uh, we will need in our integration the dm the uh, mass of this small circular disk and obviously the mass is equal to rho times dy dv the volume times the uh, what is that rho guys it is on tip of my tongue density specific density okay times dv and obviously you can see that 
instead of that volume, you can try to write the volume in terms of thickness, radius, and VR. So whenever you imagine this uh, disc as you cut it and you know roll it, the length of this disc, imagine you cut from here and you opened it. So it will be like two PR the length. And obviously uh, this is the thickness and in this direction, obviously this is 3D. Uh, you have this part, the thickness as VR as well this time. So the volume of this element, two PR T times VR and where the rho is the mass density. So moment of inertia about the z-axis, we know this general formula. So you can just simply input dm into our equation. And obviously, your integral should, should start from 0 to r. And you can see here from 0 to r. And if you further our calculations a bit, you can see that rho is constant t constant 2p 2 pi constant so they are out of integral and you just need to perform your integration uh, about r and when you perform this integral obviously you are getting one over two rho t pi r to the four and we already like stated that the mass of this disk is expressed by rho t pi r squared and obviously when you this m into our equation you are getting this equation one over two m r squared so this is the main one of the main equations that we are using uh, that we use in our previous equations uh, uh, previous problem so this is one of the terms and now we need to find out what are they for about y and x-axis so in order to find this out we need to use another theorem which is called perpendicular axis theorem. So you are, I think, quite familiar with this parallel axis theorem, but we have another theorem which is called perpendicular axis theorem. And this here, this formula actually is the uh, expression of this perpendicular axis theorem. So based on this theorem, the moment, moment of inertia about the z-axis is the sum of the moment of inertia terms about x and y axis. So by symmetry again, uh, obviously we need to have ix and iy the same values. So you can say iz is equal to two ix. So this will give you the same moment of inertia terms about x and y frames as one over four m r squared. So here, some more example, uh, some more explanation about the perpendicular axis theorem. So this is actually the explanation of the formula here. So the moment of inertia about an axis perpendicular to the plane of plane, this is, is the sum of moments of inertia of two perpendicular axis through the same point in the plane of the object. So y and x. So now try to examine the contribution of the three moments of inertia of an arbitrary mass here you can see. So the moment of inertia about the x axis here is y squared dm. Moment of inertia about y axis is dm times x squared. And the moment of inertia about the z axis here, r squared times dm. I hope this rings some bells already. Here you can see a bit more detailed version of that. Then obviously r squared, I am sure you already got this idea. r squared is x squared uh, plus y squared here, right? Zero to y squared here. Then you can easily see that y i z should be equal to i x x plus i y y. So hopefully this uh, cleared some things up, guys. And what about products of inertia? We just spoke about moments of inertia. So what about what about the products of inertia of that thin disk? So please try to think. Like again, we are speaking about point G, and imagine now you are kind of 
in an exam and you need to find out the product of inertia of that disk about the center of mass what would you do which one would you calculate first just think about it so would you calculate iz first or sorry izx ixy iyz so which one to calculate first obviously you need to make some observations about the geometry of the question and my advice would be to check whether the geometry is symmetric symmetry is really like key symmetry is key in any problem if there is a symmetry always there is some assumption that could make life easier for you so what about it say like you know x y is it is it symmetrical with respect to x y when we are considering the point g mass center obviously mass center here it is uh, in the middle of the thickness as well like p over 2 i believe when we are speaking about mass center obviously it will be located at uh, t over 2 because our thickness is t so this will be in the middle of the thin plate so i believe this xy is a symmetric plane i think um, what about yz plane this plane do you think is it also a symmetric plane i think it is right so the observation actually tells you one very important thing that you do not need to spend time valuable time for calculating this products of inertia term so here you can see that actually these three planes are planes of symmetry which gives you all terms of products of inertia equal to zero so this is what i want to say earlier as well like if you can observe like if you can spend very short time observing the geometry of the problem it can save you enormous time uh, when you are performing your calculations